I, I think adoptionism can be very attractive uh, because it, it becomes kind of the story of local boy makes good. Hi, I'm Rachel Bomberger with Urban's Publishing. I'm here today with Michael Bird, and we're talking about his new book, Jesus the Eternal Son, Answering Adoptionist Christology. Welcome, Michael. Hello. So tell me, what is adoptionist Christology? This is not probably a term with which everyone is familiar. No, it's not. Uh, adoptionism is the view that Jesus was a human being who got adopted as God's son at some point, uh, either at his resurrection or at his baptism. And behind is the idea is that Jesus was not always the son of God. He became the son at some particular point, like the resurrection or his baptism. And this is an area that's been of, of great interest to you. And yes. And one with which you have you know, a long personal history. Uh, yes. Um, you know, I, I, for a long time in, in New Testament studies or in early Christianity, one of the views that people have put forward is the idea that the earliest Christology of the primitive church was adoptionist. And that, that is the, uh, the, the first way of articulating how Jesus related to God was adoptionist categories. And people look at certain texts in the New Testament and then they look at some groups in the second century and they argue that this was the first view of Jesus. You know, before they believed he was the Word made flesh, they believed he was a man adopted by God at his you know, resurrection or then at his baptism. And uh, that's, that's, that's been a long line in scholarship talking about the evolution of Christology from you know, human being exalted to divine status all the way through to John's Gospel. And what I've been doing uh, is uh, trying to challenge that narrative trying to say, you know, it ain't necessarily so. And the normal texts that are brought out to establish that, I don't think really say what people think they say. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is explain how I think, you know, adoptionist Christology, emerged. and it did emerge, but I think it didn't emerge till the late second century. Mm -hmm. And I think I can prove that. And the standard people lined up to be exhibit A for that uh, aren't in fact good exhibits. Mm. So how did this book, Jesus the Eternal Son, come to be? Well, that's a fantastic story. Uh, a number of years ago, I was walking around uh, the SBL book exhibits. You may be familiar with them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I saw that uh, uh, Bart Ehrman had a new book coming out called um, How Jesus Became God. And instantly my heart sank because I knew I was going to start getting emails from people all around the world who were a little bit nervous or who had met um, you know, people who had been reading uh, Ehrman's books and it interviews a lot of people have ranged from Jehovah's Witnesses um, to Muslims. I think Muslims and Jehovah's Witnesses are going to think all their Christmases came at once um, uh, with, with Ehrman's books. And, um, and, you know, and, and I got involved in some projects where we offered a response to Ehrman, but I got to debate Ehrman at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary uh, earlier this year in, uh, in February. And we had, we had a very good cordial exchange. And uh, it was a very good, you know, Bart, Bart's a very good debater, very good communicator, and he set forth his case. I set forth mine. And, uh, but, you know, after doing that, I thought, well, you know, I think I'd like to do this in a more specific volume. And I wanted to focus on this one particular aspect because it was very key to Ehrman's case. Mm -hmm. the, that idea that there was an adoptionist, or as he calls it, an exaltation Christology, was one of the first uh, ways of articulating how Jesus was divine and what that divinity kind of meant. And so I was very grateful to be able to work with Erdman's uh, to find a way I could put this book together. And uh, I like to think I've come up with a fairly competent and compelling narrative uh, expressing that I, I don't think adoptionism really emerges in the first century at all. Mm -hmm. So how do you answer adoptionist Christology? What are some of the evidences that you bring into the book? Oh, well, I do a number of things. Like one of the classic texts is Romans 1, 3 to 4, where Paul is doing, dealing with some what well, seems to be tra tra traditional material. So it precedes him, and Paul's writing about 56, 57. And what I think that text shows, Jesus was the Davidic Son of God, and then at resurrection, he becomes the Son of God in power. So it's not a change from being you know, a human being to the Son of God, but basically his role and function as the Son of God changes. So he changes from his messianic office as the Son of God to this more exalted um, vice-regently role uh, seated at the right hand of the Father. So I don't think it's the, the beginning of his divine sonship, but rather 
he has a, a new role that is triggered by resurrection and exaltation. Mm. And then we look at the, look at things like the uh, the Gospel of Mark. I spend a lot of time in that. I argue the Gospel of Mark is definitely not an adoptionist tract, uh, even though some people have tried to argue that it is. And then I look at some groups like the Ebionites, who are often trotted out as having an adoptionist Christology, although I think it's probably more accurate to say they have what is called a possessionist Christology, where this um, entity called the Christ comes upon to the man Jesus. So Jesus and Christ are somewhat separated. Mm -hmm. And then I look at a few other different groups, and, uh, and then you get to a, uh, uh, a heresy, uh, that was in Rome in the 190s by a group called the Theodosians, and that's when I think you get to the real first full Monty, genuine bona fide adoptionist is then. Um, you know, not in the early church to begin with, not even with the Ebionites in the second century, not till the very end. So that's the basic narrative I'm telling. Mm -hmm. What real world implications does all of this have for us today? This conversation. Yeah, well, you can find uh, modern versions of adoptionism operating. And I mean, there is a danger with that because I, I think adoptionism can be very attractive uh, because it, it becomes kind of the story of a sort of meritocracy where Jesus kind of earned his divinity, you know, by, you know, by, by being the miracles he did, by his, his vocation or, or you know, being obedient to the Father. And it, it can create that sort of, you know, American mythology. Uh, or it coheres with that mythology of local boy makes good, you know, you know, a local boy kind of beats the odds and, and, and gets what he wanted to. Whereas, you know, we, we don't need a, a, a Jesus to be uh, meritorious and to set an example for us to follow so we too can get the reward, reward of divinity or eternal life when we follow his benefits. Uh, we don't need an adopted son of God, rather we need the son of God to facilitate our adoption to his heavenly father so we can be co-heirs with him and part of this this royal heavenly family and i think that's a, that's a far more biblical way of articulating it i think that's probably a far more significant uh, way of explaining uh, the christian gospel as well so i think adoptionism uh, it's a very impoverished view and it's too easy to manifest uh, in its own in our own day and age well thank you very much for helping people work through answers to this Chris, kind of christology Thank you for the book. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Rachel. It's been a pleasure.